Okay, recording. So um, sometimes it, 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 it takes a couple of uh, questions to get things going. So I don't want to jump ahead though. I've got, a, I've got just a couple, but if anybody else has something they'd like to ask, you are free to either unmute your microphone. Um, you know, being in psychology, I'm sure you'd prefer to hear your voice. Uh, as opposed to hear me reading it off to you. But if you want to type a question into the into the chat window, then I can read that one off as well. Either way. Okay. Question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Warshaw, do you ever get recognized? Like in the last 30 or 40 or so years, uh, has anybody ever on the street seen you and be like, are, are you the ET developer? Um, and if so, that how happened. is that like? That's happened like at least three times in the last 30 years, I would say. So it's, uh, I mean, out on the street in Silicon Valley and stuff, it has happened a couple of times. And usually it happens after uh, some major event, like since uh, Atari Game Over was on uh, Netflix. And uh, I was in a restaurant at one point and a couple of people at the other table started whispering and like looking over at my wife and I and staring. And eventually one of them, you know, came over and asked, is there, you're the, you're the guy from that show? And I said, well, it depends on which show. I was going to say the guy uh, from that show, yeah. That's how you're recognized. <laughs> they say, you probably think I'm that guy from ER. And yeah. They go, no, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, imagine the uh, amount of times that people get, um, like people that may look like you who are also in Silicon Valley, like, wait, <laughs> they also that, that may have get mixed you up with someone else and they ask them. Imagine how many times that's happened since Netflix has released that. That, that may have happened a number of times. I wouldn't know about that. But uh, uh, I have been recognized a couple of times. Back, uh, G4 was a, a cable channel that was devoted to video games. I don't know if it's even still uh, in existence. But for a while, they were running commercials, and I did some commercials for them, for some promos. And after that, I had, uh, like, a fry. Sometimes I'll get uh, recognized. Now, at classic gaming conventions, it's a different story. I get recognized a lot there. In fact, the last time I went to uh, a classic gaming convention was uh, a year ago, last October, in Portland, at the uh, Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And what I found out was someone was running around impersonating me. I went up to a booth and where they sell games and stuff, and I always like to walk up and go, hey, have you got any Yards Revenge <laughs> or ETs? And I just like to do that to them. And I went up to one booth and asked them that, and they said, Oh yeah, you know, the guy who made it was just here. I said, really? That's amazing. I said, what was his name? <laughs> they said, well, we're not sure of his name. I said, well, you know, if you look in the packaging, you can find out his name was Howard Scott Warshaw, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I think that was it. And I showed him my driver's license. I said, you know, I'm Howard Scott Warshaw. I said, I don't know who that other guy was, but there was somebody running around the show impersonating me. I thought that was really odd. That had never happened before. So. I guess sometimes I have gotten recognized and sometimes people are running around trying to get recognized as me. So I guess it goes both ways. That's curious. I wonder what their motivation was. I don't know. I've never met anyone who really wanted to be, be me before. So that was, uh, that was an unusual experience. Well, it's great to have fans. I think it's great you've been recognized. I mean, I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's telling. I, I don't know nowadays what kind of celebrities game developers become but uh you know as your thing said you're you're the most famous person that people have never heard of but here everybody everybody knows who you are <clears throat> we do have well it's true this is the wrong crowd for that long yeah that's right that's right <laughs> they're all expected to know that would be a good exam question to show your picture and say who is this um so we do have some uh some questions in the chat oh one says g4 is coming back right i, I thought i did hear something about that but i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure um, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure how viable it would be. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but I see like, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Pluto TV, for example, which is like a web-based kind of streaming thing. They've got a, a couple of game oriented channels. So with, you know, with things like Twitch and all of that, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that would be a viable thing to do, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure. And so of course, um, <laughs> Oh, somebody said Ninja Warrior on G4. So of course, some of the questions are, are gaming related. And, and I guess before I ask a couple of them, I'm wondering, are you, do you still, are you still um, involved in the gaming community, the gaming industry? Are you, do you, are you still a gamer yourself? Uh, 
How would you how would you describe that? Oh, I'm I'm not really involved in the industry. I am peripherally, <laughs> so yeah, to speak. Right. But uh, uh, the way I'm involved, in some ways, I've come full circle, right? Because I used to develop games to entertain nerds, and now what I do is I actually work with nerds to make their lives better <laughs> in a more fundamental way. And uh, I don't develop games anymore, although I do have one design. I have a Yars Revenge sequel that I'm really thinking of doing oh, with someone on. getting a developer together and driving the design for it, because it's a gameplay I've never seen done. In 30 years, I've never seen anybody else do this gameplay. Okay. So it seems, it seems like a fun gameplay. Now you can't. I, I am a. I do play. I do play games. Though. Okay. All I'm right. A ho Good. Hopeless Candy Crush addict. It's, uh, oh, okay. That's I'm a, not necessarily proud of it, but it's yeah. True. And that, that that leads to another another raging debate in the game community as to whether people who are primarily mobile gamers are actually gamers, or whether they're just some kind of casual version, you know. And so, I'm not that into labels, so. It's, um, I just oh. like to think of it as entertainment. Yeah, well, you know, the, the game community, they can, be, uh, they can be funny sometimes. So- uh, They're hysterical. Yeah, right. So th I mean, the question was, what's your favorite game from this decade or last decade, I guess it says. Um, but I'd, I'd also be interested, not just that, uh, if you have an opinion on that, but what, you know, other than your own, I mean, and, and um, you know, your games were really inventive, I thought, and so it would be easy to choose one of them as a, as a favorite game. But, you know, games outside of your own development that you felt were particularly well done or ones you were a fan of or anything like that. Uh, you know, Eugene Jarvis is a guy who I think was probably one of the best game designers ever. He did Robotron and Defender. Uh, things that really have stood the test of time as amazing games. In terms of the history and the evolution of game design, uh, I think one of the most significant games, and one of my favorite games actually, is uh, GTA 3, Grand Theft Auto 3, and Vice City. I think those will stand as the transition from 2D to 3D gaming, and in creating an immersive experience. They also, I think that game, I mean, it has a reprehensible design, but, it's amazing game design. It's an amazing lesson in game design. There's one thing that happens in game design. Like when you think about next generation and next generation, how do we move forward? How do we improve and how do we get better? Uh, I'm assuming you're all familiar with the concept of what we call narrow casting. The idea that there's only a few genres or types of games and people just keep elaborating the same thing. You know, as you get into console development, which is big, uh, expensive monolithic development teams it's very it, it, it costs too much money to take a lot of risks so people tend to you know confine risk by just doing what they know works so they just elaborate when you're going to elaborate elaborating technology is easy it's easy to get more polygons on a screen to just get better graphics to get more photorealistic you can always count on doing that to me, that doesn't make a game better. It makes a game look better, but I don't know that it makes a game play better. Game design, actual design of the gameplay experience, that's a very different animal, okay? You, it, you can rely on improving technology. You can't always rely on improving design because that takes real innovation and creativity. You know, when I was doing games at Atari, the goal was to do something that no one's seen before, to do something new, to do something innovative, which really worked for me. The idea of elaborating stuff everybody else is familiar with and seen and just making it a little more what it is. Uh, I, I did work back in games in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I found it very unsatisfying uh, because it was just an elaboration. But here's the thing about Grand Theft Auto, that I think is, is remarkable from a game design standpoint, because I think it really was innovative design-wise. And here's why. The, the game itself, if you look at it compared to other games of the time, technologically, graphically, and things like that, it wasn't really like any kind of super innovative game. It wasn't super innovative graphics technology. Uh, the play space was not the largest of any of the games out at the time by any means. What it was, was they took a play space that was a decent size and they ran so many missions on it and you ran it in the same space. 
uh, instead of having a different level for each mission, you ran all of your missions on the same levels. And what that did, that I think was revolutionary, was it really gave you a chance to learn things during one mission that actually helped you out in other areas of the mission, and that in other missions, rather. And that was an amazing thing to do, because when you have, because now you're creating a game world. You're not creating a bunch of discrete uh, levels or discrete challenges that are each independent of each other, which is easier as a developer to do. But what you're doing is you're creating a game world, and that world is consistent and it makes sense. And things you think of in one part of the world actually work and make sense in another part of the world. And a lot of games don't do that. That's a, tr that's a tough thing to do in a game. The other thing they did was, you know, whatever weapons you have, there's a thing I call key and lock sy syndrome in games. And that is you can have 15 different guns in a game, but to blast through this door, only one gun works. And that doesn't really make much sense, right? I mean, you have a bazooka instead of a handgun, that can make sense. But it, essentially in GTA 3, you know, if you're going to kill somebody, there's a lot of different ways to kill them, right? You, you can shoot them, you can stab them, you can shoot them from close up, you can shoot them from far away, you can stick them in the trunk of your car and take your car to the garbage dump and have it crushed and compiled. You can blow them up. The thing is, all the things you think you should be able to do in that game, you can do. There isn't any arbitrary, well, because it's this particular door, this particular person, or this particular mission, you happen to need something special that ordinarily wouldn't make sense. Everything in that game makes sense. So to design a game and implement a game where everything you use in it works universally the way the player intuitively would expect, that is an amazing accomplishment. And that's design. Right, that's not technology, that's design. That's game design and implementation. And I think GTA 3 just did an amazing and a huge quantum leap forward in that area. And that's something that's not about the technologists, that's something that's about the designers. And I have a lot of respect for that crew. Rockstar, they put out some amazing stuff, game ones. Very impressive crew. So, does that answer your question? I think that was a I think that was a great answer, and I was especially glad. I, I didn't expect it actually, GTA three, but I was especially glad to hear your key and lock thing because in our videos for this week, we were talking about what I personally refer to as the CLD or the conveniently locked door. It's the it's the door that for whatever reason is locked for some mysterious purpose and only opens under some kind of magical, uh, you know, you, you haven't talked to the right person or you haven't done the right thing, and it, it's not locked, and then it magically opens. So it's similar to what you were talking about there. So I was, I was very glad to hear that. We're getting a lot of good questions. Some, some referring to microtransactions and loot boxes. I'd like to come back to that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, oh, and somebody said, uh, that's interesting. A lot of people said similar reasons about how Breath of the Wild's game design works. And somebody else agreed, yeah, Breath of the Wild as well. Um, so uh, a couple of other questions, delving a little bit into um, your current profession, uh, and I think that they're, they're, they're interesting questions as well. What made you consider psychotherapy out of all other professions? Were you interested in it when you were younger? Did you consider other professions when you were transitioning out of the gaming industry? And I believe I remember uh, seeing in one of the TV episodes or perhaps the documentary that you tried real estate, which you realized was not your your thing, and then you transitioned into this, uh, in, in where and you've you've really feel you found your home. I've had many careers. I mean, I'm not a person who sits still for very long or can. It's you know, I'm amazed I'm still here right now. But it's uh, I think it's I like to stretch myself. I like to find new ways, new things to explore, new avenues you know to venture into. But what I like is I don't like to have to let go of all my past experience. I like to find something that incorporates everything I've done and add some new dimension to it. That to me is real. It's not only growth, which is interesting, but I think leveraging your past is also a useful endeavor. I enjoy that a great deal. So I was always interested in that. In fact, when I was in high school, a very good friend of mine and I were going to develop our own personality theory. We were both, that was our plan. We were both going to do that. And then uh, we graduated high school, and he went uh, to the Air Force Academy, and I went to, to Tulane University in New Orleans and studied economics, then mathematics, then computer engineering, then theater. 
and all this stuff and ended up in the computer world. And we both went totally away from psychology. But the funny thing was, you know, ultimately I did become a therapist and he married one. So we both sort of came back to it in one way or another. But the thing is, I was always interested in psychology, but totally walked away from it. And at one point, uh, when things were kind of just sort of falling apart for me, uh, in about 2006, 2007, uh, I was kind of depressed. And I didn't really know what was going on. And someone asked me, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I know what I have to do. And they said, no, no, what do you want to do? If you could do anything, you know, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a therapist. I just knew I wanted to be a therapist. In fact, I had been a technical manager for a while uh, in a gaming company. And what I realized was when I was doing this job, you know, most technical managers, uh, their job is to cultivate technolo technological development in their employees, right? You get people who are working for you to get more to their tech or progress in their tech on their tech ladder and where they're going. And I wasn't interested in that at all. I never found that to be very important. It was, I never found it hard to motivate programmers to want to program. They're totally into it. But a lot of programmers get themselves into social situations that distract them from their program. <laughs> what I found was I seemed to have a real facility for helping people resolve their social issues. And that made it easier for them to then go on and do their work. And I found that that was an effective strategy as a manager for me. But I also found that I was enjoying the part of helping my employees deal with their social issues more than I was enjoying doing the tech work that we were doing. And so at some point I just bit the bullet and said, you know, maybe I should just go and do what I've been kind of half doing all my life anyway. Because I'm also, I'm the kind of person who, you know, if you're sitting next to me on a plane or a bus or whatever, you'll just start telling your life story. I'm the guy who people tell everything to. For some reason, I'm just, I just have that kind of aura about me. And so people always either think I'm a therapist. I, people always, are you a therapist? Are you sure? Seems like you're a therapist. I heard that a lot most of my life. So therapy and I were destined to run into each other eventually. So I tried it as a client, and now I'm the president. <laughs> so that's an old commercial many of you have probably never seen. I remember that one. I remember it well, yeah. Right, the hair club. That's right, yeah. I'm not just a client. I'm also the also president. The president, that's right. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember that well. And it seems like you're having great success at this. And so to build on that, another question is, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from helping these super smart people navigate their lives? Well, one thing I've learned is no matter how smart you are, you're never too smart to outsmart yourself. <laughs> the thing is that uh, the, way I, the way I explain it to people, like for one thing is I don't profess to be super intelligent, right? I'm not going to pretend. I don't have to be smarter than my client to help them. I just have to be smart enough. Okay, what I need to do is not get caught up in their little, you know, hedge maze of uh, their own creation. So the way I explain it to people is that intelligence, people think of intelligence as a, uh, a personality trait, but it's really not. Intelligence is just a tool. It's just a thing that's there, right? So a more intelligent person will be able to achieve something faster, better, or cheaper than a less intelligent person. So intelligence doesn't help you select goals, it just helps you achieve them, right? So what if your goal is to fool yourself? Well, intelligent people do that better too, right? They create more elaborate ways of fooling themselves. So because, you know, when you're you, your brain knows all the best places to hide to get away from you, right? So it's, uh, you know, fooling yourself is good at any level. But the thing about it is, is that when you work with people who are really, who really are extremely intelligent, when you get to be like two, three, four sigmas over the average intelligence, you start to get the sensation like, I'm too smart to get fooled. Nobody can fool me. And it's true, very few people outside of themselves can fool them. But then they make this jump to, well, since nobody can fool me, I probably can't fool myself. And that's usually where they stumble. And so what I'm very good at is not getting distracted or confused by the razzle-dazzle that really smart people can throw into a conversation. And I'm very good at just staying on point and saying, you know, all that, that's all very interesting and stuff, but I, it occurs to me you forgot to answer my simple question. <laughs> so 
because sometimes you ask people a very simple, you ever ask somebody a very simple question and get a very not simple answer? And you can end up talking to them for 15, 20 minutes, and then at some point you may remember, wait a minute, I never got the answer to my first question. Well, sometimes that's just an innocent thing that happens, and sometimes that's an actual strategy to avoid answering the first question in the first place without you noticing. So I'm just usually pretty good at not getting lost in that. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I'm reasonably good at it. I would imagine those people can bring some uh, some challenging situations too, I would think. Everybody can bring a challenging situation. Yeah. Well, that's, that's true. Right. Sure. That's right. But yeah. it is also true that like super intelligent people get into more interesting problems than the average okay. person right. does at times. And I do enjoy that. I do enjoy, I, I do find it fascinating that uh, like people ask me sometimes, well, you have all these clients and they all have very involved lives and they're all doing all this stuff. How do you keep them? straight you know you start messing them up or getting and what i tell them is like well how many different shows do you watch how many shows are you following because a client is like a show right it's like in fact sometimes i actually call sessions episodes you know i'll say well in our last episode here's what happened you know i wonder what's going on with this character over here now right. so if you think of it as watching these these movies that you're going to comment on that's how i keep it all straight because i am all about media and tv and movies so my therapy practice is not really any different. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. All right. Um, really good questions coming in. Um, these, these getting back to the, uh, to the Atari days. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the work culture at Atari? How was it different from other companies at the time? And also, would you say the non-conventional culture at the company contributed to its success early on? And I assume when they say early on, they're referring to, you know, like the Nolan Bushnell years as opposed to the Ray Kassar and Warner years. I would definitely figure that's the case, yeah. So uh, getting to Atari was really interesting because it was a very free environment. Because if you think about it, and this is another thing I go into in great detail in the book. It's like, what does it mean to have a creative environment? A lot of people write about that, a lot of people talk about it, but I just cover it from the point of view of like, you know, what does that mean? What is, you know, being creative, when your job is to think of something nobody's thought of before, that's kind of an interesting job description. It's like, you know when you did your job, but you don't know how you're gonna do it. You know, I mean, how many times have you got up in the morning and said, hey, I think what I'll do is figure something out I've never thought of before today. That's what I'll do. That's a tricky thing to do. And then if you add, yeah, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna think of something nobody's ever thought of before, which actually most people probably do every day, but it's gonna be something everybody else thinks is cool. That's a lot tougher. Because it's easy to come up with some you know, goof off thought or whatever, or something just really off the wall that maybe nobody has actually thought of before. That doesn't make it interesting or entertaining or useful. Right, but to come up with something that's actually on target, that works well, that's going to get people involved and compelled, uh, that's, that's a, a pretty big challenge. And so I, what's funny is I went to Atari. I didn't go there to do games. <laughs> Most of the people who were at Atari went there to do games. It was all about, oh, my God, video games. They were all new, and everybody was so into it. It was so cool. And that's why everybody who went to Atari went to Atari. They wanted to make games. And I didn't. <laughs> I went to Atari because I like to do real-time control microprocessor-based coding. I mean, that's what I like to do. Now, I like games. I have always liked games. I like analyzing games, I like playing games. But I didn't grow up with video games, right? Back in my day, and I can't believe I'm saying shit like that. <laughs> it's like... I grew up, I didn't have video games. Video games didn't exist until I was out of high school. So uh, I played board games, I played card games. I, I was very into games. But when I thought of a career, I never thought of games. But I, I went to college and I did some very unusual computer work in college that was real-time control programming at its infancy. And that really was cool. That really turned me on. I enjoyed that kind of work, the challenge of it. And then uh, I got to Hewlett Packard. I went to work for Hewlett Packard, and I was just bored out of my mind. I could not believe that this that computers could be this boring. I didn't think computers could be boring because everything I had known about computers was very interesting. 
So I was kind of really floundering at Hewlett Packard, and I would act out, because that's another thing is I'm, you wouldn't know it to talk to me, but I'm kind of a wild and crazy guy. And at, uh, I would act out and do some weird stuff, and people would go home and tell Howard's story. And one guy came up, a guy I worked with came up to me and said, I was telling my wife a Howard story the other day. And uh, she said stuff like that goes on all the time where she works. I said, oh, where's that? He goes, Atari. And I had I heard of Atari, but I never thought of working at a place like Atari. So I called them up and I got in for some interviews and I found out the kind of programming they were doing. And that's exactly the kind of work that I wanted to do. And it was very exciting to see. And, and it was a very wide open, crazy environment. And it was the only place I've ever been where during the interview, they asked me if I smoked pot or if pot was okay with me because it was so prevalent in the environment there that if you really had a problem with it, you probably would have an issue working there. And, but I did not have a problem with that, so that turned out to be fine. And, uh, and it looked like a great job match because here they were doing exactly the kind of programming that I was very skilled at and in an environment that was wild enough to, where I wouldn't be a zookeese. And, uh, and so they rejected me. <laughs> When I first went through Atari, they rejected me, and I actually had to talk them into hiring me, which I did, fortunately. And it was, uh, that's another very long and interesting story. But the environment itself was pretty wacky. It was pretty wild. You had, when you have real creative people just sort of wandering around relatively unrestrained, you see some interesting things. There was, um, there was a, when I first got there, there was, there, was, there was this guy who was walking down the hallway, and he was just sort of talking to himself. And usually I'm pretty good at identifying languages. If I, I can't speak the language, but I can at least get an idea of like what language that kind of is. And I had no idea what this was. This was something it's like I've never heard before. And so somebody else said to me, oh yeah, you're wondering about that guy, yeah. So this was a guy who had a twin. He'd grown up with a twin and they had their own language. So he used to think out loud. He used to walk around the hallways and think out loud in this private language, you know, proprietary language, I guess, that he and his uh, sibling would share. And that was interesting. You had people who were there at any time. People had different kinds of hours, right? So like when there, you'd, have, you'd come in at like 9.30 in the morning and there would be some people who'd be coming in to start their day and there'd be some people who had been there all night who were just ending their day. There was always someone there around the clock. And there were a lot of shenanigans. There were a lot of pranks and goofy things that were going on. Because when your job is, so this was a very stringent technical environment, right? So the people you had there had to be very, very creative and technically proficient programmers uh, just to be able to make the machine run because it was a very primitive hardware. But then you had to be able to make something that was fun. You couldn't just be a tech hack because that wasn't enough. You had to have enough goofiness in you. So you had to be technical enough to, make, to run the machine and you had to be goofy enough to do something that's offbeat with it that would be fun. So what you had was some really smart, really wacky people in the environment. And boy, that was what I wanted. You know, I almost became one. And it's, uh, it was just, so it was so gratifying. It was like so cool to be in a place. And everybody who was there had something else that they did. They all had some other skill or talent or ability. There were a lot of musicians. There were a lot of artists. There were some craftspeople. There were, uh, there were, one guy was building a boat. He's always working on a boat, building his own boat. Uh, a lot of musicians. Uh, it was just a very interesting and creative crew. And we would do weird things because if you're supposed to make a game, you're trying to create new gameplays and new ideas of what's fun. What does it mean to goof off? What does it mean to screw around? Because we could be screwing around and come up with an idea for a game. Well, then we weren't screwing around, were we? We were kind of doing research. So I came up with this concept of you can be passively goofing off or actively goofing off. And if you were passively goofing off, which is literally just doing nothing, well, then you're just screwing around. But if you're actively goofing off, that's kind of research. So the idea is if we're not really working, you need to be doing something which is generating stimulus that might 
you know, it, it might give you an idea, but if just doing it in front of other people might give someone else an idea, because it was that it was bouncing off the walls and off of each other is the ways to think of it, that uh, it created a very interesting and volatile mix. Yeah, I think that's, um, <clears throat> I, I w also wanted to comment because we've spoken about this a little bit in the class, the, the idea that, you know, having the technical skills to do something doesn't mean, necessarily mean that you can then use that to create something compelling. The, the design process has to match up with the technical skills that you have, you know. To, to it does not mean that at all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, you know, nowadays, and uh, not just nowadays, I mean, it wasn't very, you see, the thing was, we used to make a lot of money too. We got to the point, there was some real wars. Initially, we made very little money. And then when programmers started to get out, other comp competing companies started opening up, like Imagic and Activision and stuff. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. So there became like bidding war for talent in video games. And so we started to make a lot of money. And so future generation machines, uh, the first priority in making a future generation machine wasn't just better graphics. It was trying to create an easier programmer interface because if more people can do the job, you don't have to pay them as much, right? It's just supply and demand. So I also have a degree in economics. So it's like uh, that principle was in operation. The 2600 was a very obscure, very weird hardware. Not many people could work on it. So we ended up getting a lot of money because it was a super profitable product. Then there was the video game crash, which I go into extensively in the book as to why that happened and where it came from. But as we all know, E.T. caused the entire crash. Oh, well, there we go. But the real reason for the crash and a simple capsule would be it was the first product life cycle. If you think about it, this was the first time a video game console went wide, went big, that it was really through the stratosphere, right? And so nobody had ever done a video game. You know, video game consoles, people thought of them like phonographs, right? You know, you have a phonograph, and then you buy records. And no matter how many records you buy or what, what kind of music you put on the records, the record is the record. And the phonograph doesn't really care what the record is. It'll play the record if it's got a groove and away you go. So that's the way they thought about video games. We'll make a console and it just plays cartridges. And then people will make cartridges and we'll make cartridges because nobody else knows how to make these cartridges. You gotta be kidding. It's way too complicated. So they didn't do anything to protect the console, which meant if other people figured out how to make cartridges, anybody could just pop one on. So, it, it, the, but the thing is with phonographs, like when you made a phonograph, nobody thought, oh my God, we gotta come up with the next gen phonograph that can play this same record so much better, even though it's the same sound, right? It doesn't make, a next gen phonograph doesn't really make much sense. And that's the kind of thinking that people had when they were looking at the first game console. So, but the truth is with game console, people adapt to them, they grow some, and then they're, they're obsolete because new tech comes out and away we go. And, and you've got to keep up. But nobody knew that the first time around. So it was the first product life cycle, which means, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with William Goldman, who's a very famous Hollywood screenwriter. Obviously, he's not that famous, but he had this thing he called the first law of Hollywood. And he said, the first law of Hollywood is nobody knows anything. Because if anybody really knew anything, would studios ever put out a flop? Right? Or would a studio ever pass on a hit movie? If anybody really knew what they were doing with entertainment, people wouldn't make mistakes. But in the entertainment business, there are more mistakes than there are hits, right? Which proves this theory that when it comes to entertainment and really understanding what people want, people don't really know. So, how, so what happens? Well, when you get someone who has several hits, well, who knows what they know, but for whatever reason, they have some magic formula that works. So we can't always capture lightning in a bottle, right? But some people seem to have a much higher hit rate in entertainment than others. And so those people tend to make a lot of money because the entertainment business has a lot of money because people like entertainment and a lot of resources always go in that direction. We live in a world today now where it's easier for people to compose and put entertainment out. 
So it used to be much harder to do that. It used to be you had to have a publisher and a huge printing press and big runs to put a book out. Now you can self-publish a book. Any yo-yo can put out a book now. I'm putting a book out, which proves anybody can put a book out. And this is my fourth book, but it's probably my most interesting book. That's because I decided to write boring books the first three. That was my goal. And I think I succeeded because success is important too. So the thing is, people didn't get what it meant to have a first console. They didn't get the idea that, you know, a record player can't look at a record and decide if it wants to play it or not, right? As long as the needle fits the groove, the phonograph will play the record. But a video game is a computer, and if you program it right, it can decide if it wants to play this cartridge or not. Nobody really got that, so they didn't take advantage of it. Nowadays, try just releasing a cartridge on the PlayStation 5 or on the Xbox. It's not going to work, right? <laughs> because there's the, they got their own lock and key thing going on. Because there was a lot of things that everybody, starting right back with the uh, Sega and Nintendo back in the next generation when games come back in is one of the first things everybody learned is how Atari screwed up. And so Atari really laid the basis for the industry in a lot of ways, some by example and some by counterexample. There are a lot of people profited from the mistakes that killed Atari, but people watched it and learned and they didn't have to fall prey to the same problem. Some people call it the first penguin syndrome. Right? When all the penguins are going up because they're looking for fish and coming down to the water, the first penguin who's one who breaks the ice usually is the one who gets eaten by the seals. But somebody has to be the first penguin to clear the way for the other penguins to start flooding the water and going out there and getting the fish. And Atari, in a lot of ways, was the first penguin. And some people say I was the first penguin's butt. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know about I am turning into a pumpkin at 430, though, unfortunately. <clears throat> Oh, okay. And, that, yeah, and that's all that we had it scheduled for anyway. So in that case, just very quickly, um, speaking of the, uh, speaking of, of what happened with Atari, of the crash, a uh, lot of companies making games, a lot of them were not so good. That's one of the things Nintendo tried to, tried to fix with their seal of quality and the lockout chip and all of that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, a lot of good questions still left to ask. I'm sorry, I won't be able to ask all of them. But um, this we should one, do this again sometime. This doesn't have to be the last time we chat. If people are interested, it's a pretty good crowd. Well, I can take a poll. We can do another one next week. Next week is the last week of class, but if they're open for it, then uh, I would be happy to do another one, and, and I'll, I'll poll the students and see what they say. Well, that's a pretty short term, yeah. Also, I can't seem to share a screen. I was going to share a uh, pic of uh, the, uh, the cover of my upcoming book, so you can recognize oh. it when you don't buy it. Uh, let's see. Try now. Can you do it now? Yes, I can. Thank okay. you. Share this. Can everybody see that? Hey, look at that. That's a famous picture. I, I think I've seen that exact picture many times. You have seen this picture. This picture has been out in a lot of places and stuff. It was taken by a guy named Dave Stagas, who was a programmer at Atari, who did Centipede for the 2600. Oh, all right. Okay. Oh. And uh, this is in my office. And if you look on the screen, this is actually, I was working on ET when this picture was taken. So this is me working at ET. The t-shirt that I'm wearing is a very elaborate story that happened on my 25th birthday, which is when this was taken. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a story. I think uh, a lot of people find it very compelling. You, you know what they say, it's uh, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll kiss 15 bucks goodbye. That's what they say. Oh, but it's uh, oh, we have some, some interesting comments on the picture. Um, we have we have so many questions left, you know, in, in the chat. Um, you know, when I said I would poll the students, a lot of them have already said they would love to do it again if you're able. And so I don't know if you are, but I, I think we could that's something we could discuss and see if there would be an opportunity to, to do like a part two. We could absolutely discuss it. We could even talk about it. We could approach the very precipice of the verge of the possibility. I'd be okay. open to that. Absolutely. Okay. That sounds great. All right. And so in that case, I will see, and even here comes another one. Oh, good. Very positive responses to that statement. Outstanding. So I'm actually going to make, uh, I'm going to make copies of some of these, uh, of some of these questions. And, and for the next time we'll ask them, there's, there's questions about 
the crash. There's questions about Atari's true business motivations for thinking that something, you know, could, could you, did they really think you could release something of quality in five weeks' time, speaking of ET, of course? And That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. And so everybody is saying that they would love to do that. So I will, um, we, we are only scheduled till 4.30, and, and I know you have to go. I actually have some more questions of my own. And so I, I think there's a lot more to cover here. So just for now, um, it, to wrap up, first of all, I just, I want to say my, my, you know, sincere gratitude for you taking the time to do this and to talk to everybody. We've talked about you and Atari. We spent a lot of time covering the history of the industry. And obviously, Atari is a big part of that and your role in it. Uh, is a big part of that discussion as well. I know everybody here, this was a great turnout and everybody here was really um, excited to see you and to hear you and to hear what you had to say. And so I just, I, I wanna thank you for taking the time and, and sharing all of this with the class. Uh, it was my pleasure. I really enjoy this sort of thing. I love, you know, I like talking. I'm a talking kind of guy. It's one of the reasons yeah. I became a therapist. I decided to become a professional talker. But uh, it was a pleasure working with all of you or sharing this with you. and. You know, this book will be out next week. I hate to act like I'm hawking my book, but I'm definitely hawking my book. So please buy my book. And That's fine. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'd love to chat more. If you, if you enjoyed this talk, if you enjoyed the stuff that I was saying, you will really like this book. because It sounds just like me. Perfect. And then we will also be in touch about perhaps setting up a part two of this very session that we were having. Cool. I'd be okay. happy to look at that. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, there's a recording of this. I will make that available on, on Canvas and Yuja. And um, again, thank you, and we will be in touch. Excellent. Take care. Right. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>